Fox News starts right now. Tonight, the nation's largest Latino civil rights organization is mourning the death of its longtime national general counsel, Luis Roberto Vera Jr. of San Antonio. And we know that Vera fought many court battles on behalf of LULAC, the League of Latin American Citizens. And even as his health worsened, he took on voting restrictions and redistricting. Jesse DeGoyado now with a remembrance by those who say he was a fighter up to the very end. In his last speech, Luis Vera Jr. told the state LULAC convention, don't blame the new generation. It can change, but you must find that passion. We haven't passed on the baton to the younger generation in terms of passion. We've allowed them to take for granted some of the things that they have because of others before us who fought on our behalf. LULAC's state director was there to hear it, and so was its former national president. It was silence, uh, totally silence as he spoke, and he spoke from his heart. But when it came to filing high-profile lawsuits, a longtime colleague says Luis Vera Jr. was a good lawyer and an even better negotiator. He could, um, he could be almost charming when he would talk to people, or he could be vicious. Whether it's redistricting, whether it's voter suppression, where there's any kind of civil rights violation. Rosa Rosales says Vera fought for those who couldn't. So much so, Rosales says he was a hero. He will be greatly missed. He's a great leader for all of us. I know for me, he was always there. And we'll always remember him as a great fighter for justice. An inspiration, she says, for others to take up a seemingly never-ending fight for social justice and equality. I know that Lulac has lost a great, great son. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. We are learning more about last night's shooting on Broadway. San Antonio police arrested 28-year-old Daniel Perez in connection to a shooting at an apartment complex near the Pearl. Perez is accused of shooting a 44-year-old man after an argument inside one of those units that you see there. The victim is in critical condition at the hospital, and we know that Perez is facing an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers are searching for the people involved in a deadly shooting from more than two years ago. This happened in early October 2019 at the River City Saloon. 21-year-old Brandon Olguin was a security guard at that bar. He was shot and killed while on the job. SAPD says that an argument happened inside the bar and Olguin intervened. At some point, someone in the bar pulled out a gun and a shootout began. Witnesses say that they saw multiple people firing. Anyone with any information on what may have happened is asked to call Crime Stoppers. That number 210-224-TIPS. A bonfire that started in the backyard of an east side home didn't stay there. It spread, destroying that home in the 300 block of Vine Street and also damaging the one next door. Katrina Weber spoke with a neighbor who says that the flames came way too close to his family. What was at the center of a gathering of friends quickly became the focus of attention for San Antonio fire crews. A backyard bonfire on Vine Street near South Walters had become a raging house fire. When firefighters arrived after 11.30 last night, flames already were through the roof. My surveillance cameras, they just kept going off, and uh, I woke up to check them, and I noticed, you know, the, the back of the house was on fire. Ruben Castillo thought the constant beeping that woke him up might be a burglar. Instead, his cameras showed the threat was coming from the fire next door. He got his family out safely and saw that his neighbors had done the same. His home, though, also took a heated hit. The window was shattered, a part of the house, it's, it's, uh, it caught on fire as well. It even melted some of his cameras. At the home where the fire started, there was even more destruction. The man who lives here told me that he and his friends started that backyard fire as a way to keep warm, but at some point things got too hot for them to handle. He says he's not sure exactly what caused the fire to spread. They started the bonfire and, you know, we, we were just like, OK, you know, they're, they're back there, you know. Castillo says he'd never expected the friendly fire he saw before he went to sleep would become the frightening sight that woke him up. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. You've heard about the labor shortage and the supply shortage. Well, one local organization serving mostly seniors has a volunteer shortage. At Meals on Wheels San Antonio, the number of people they serve has doubled, and most are homebound. 
Right now they are about 90 volunteers short every single week, and they are not the only ones. The San Antonio Salvation Army needs more bell ringers for its annual Red Kettle campaign. But other organizations meantime, including Elf Louise and Raul Jimenez Thanksgiving dinner, they've had to turn away volunteers. We're following the guidelines and we're taking the precautions that have been requested of us to minimize the number of volunteers in the kitchen. This year we're at about from beginning to end 450 with only about 15 volunteers per shift. If you'd like to help out Meals on Wheels or the Salvation Army by being a bell ringer, we have all the information on how to get involved on our website. Go to ksat.com. He's a local surgeon who saved lives on battlefields abroad and in local operating rooms. In his military experiences, he realized that a tool that he used during surgeries needed to be redesigned. So he did it himself. Case has Courtney Friedman explains how his patented surgical retractor is already saving lives. Dr. Ramon Sestero was active duty Navy for 10 years, deploying seven times, three to combat zones. During those deployments, uh, it was uh, evident that the equipment we use uh, for surgery downrange uh, has some challenges. Surgical retractors open the abdomen during procedures. On the battlefield, they're small and simple, getting the job done but offering poor visibility. The ones used in hospitals around the world are larger but have to latch to tables and are not as good for speed. What we've done is combine the two most commonly used retractors in the world and combine their advantages while taking out their disadvantages. Sestero is now a trauma surgeon at University Hospital and a professor of surgery at UT Health San Antonio, where he spent seven years developing the Titan CSR. This retractor is only two pounds. If you compare that to the other retractors that they're using right now in hospital settings, those can be up to 20 pounds. It is really genius, at, just at its simplicity. Dr. Brian Eastridge was an Army surgeon for 31 years with six combat deployments. As the University Hospital Trauma and Emergency Surgery Division Chief, his team was the first to demo the Titan CSR. To actually put our hands on it, work with it, have it be really useful, and now the potential to get it out there to other surgeons across the country, really tremendous potential. Surgeons are already testing the retractor at Brook Army Medical Center, Dell Trauma Center in Austin, and other hospitals in Florida and New York. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. It is Alzheimer's Awareness Month, a time to educate and a time to recognize the plight of all those who deal with this disease. There are six million Americans over the age of 65 living with Alzheimer's. By the year 2050, that number is expected to double. Ursula Perry explains what those who are at risk are doing to be a super ager, staying mentally sharp in your 80s, 90s and beyond. For 84-year-old David Albertson and 83-year-old Alan Woods, age is nothing but a number. I don't think about my age. Both may be considered super-agers or have the cognitive function that's comparable to that of an average middle-aged adult. A study from Northwestern University found that those who are super-agers lose brain volume at a slower pace than normally aging adults, putting super-agers at a lower risk for dementia. So, what are super agers doing to keep their minds young? I think that's important to stay active. The risk for developing Alzheimer's disease triples for individuals with a body mass index over 30. Also, challenging your mind can keep it in shape. David does crossword puzzles every day to keep his mind sharp. I've been doing it uh, for over 50 years, uh, probably 60 years. And research found superagers also had a greater circle of friends and family. It's just common sense. You've just got to, got to keep moving. You've got to keep your mind sharp. And if you have family and friends, you're in great shape. Another tip. Indulging in a glass of alcohol can keep your mind young. Northwestern University actually did a study about moderate drinking and found that those who do have 23% less likely risk of developing Alzheimer's. The key though, moderation. If you drink over the recommended amount, you increase your risk for the disease. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, at 6.08, let's take you outside right now to our live cam, 62 degrees right now. And if you like the lights that you see here of our own skyline here in San Antonio, just hold up. Oh, yeah, we got zoo lights going on tonight. You know, we like to joke that when Adam Kasky's out of the studio, it's Adam in the wild. This actually, you know, it's, it's pretty perfect. <laughs> in the wild, I like that, Myra. Rawr. 
I don't know. I felt like I had to do something there in the wild. So we're, 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 we're at, better than woof woof, right? We're, we're here at Zoo Lights at the San Antonio Zoo. It runs through January 2nd. We've perched up on this little balcony here just to get a little different vantage point uh, for this shot. You can see all the colors off in the distance. There are those lights. Some twinkling, some in pattern, some in sync to the music. And we're going to get a closer look in a moment. I do want to point out Aquifer is down four tenths of a foot today. Mold is moderate. And then we have three other allergens that are in the air that are low. Get ready for some rain and gusty winds by Thanksgiving. And it's going to be a transition day. I'm going to explain more coming right up. Homeless resource hubs started opening up around the city during the pandemic. We're digging deeper to see if they're actually helping people in need and if they're reducing the number of people on the streets. I'm Lee Waldman. That's coming up tonight on the Night Beat. As parties and fundraisers kick off, event planners are being put to the test. Why they say it's going to take more patience to get what you want on the Night Beat. Well, did you know that VIA is not the only transit system in our area? Agencies like Alamo Regional Transit and Southwest Area Regional Transit, or SWART, also connect rural communities with San Antonio and other cities. And SWART just received a prestigious federal award. Our Samuel King joins us now. So, Samuel, you went to Uvalde to see how this system works. What did you find? Well, Stephanie and Myra, drivers were on the roads as early as 2 in the morning to connect riders with medical and other services, and that's work that didn't stop during the pandemic. They take you straight to the door. I love it. For Felix Cisneros, Swart is a godsend. We were with him as he was dropped off after hours of dialysis treatment. It would be hard to get to dialysis, really, because, you know, I have a few family members, but they're always busy, you know. So it's really hard sometimes to get around if you don't have a ride here. Southwest Area Regional Transit covers a wide area in this part of Texas and certainly covering that area during 2020, during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic was certainly a challenge. Well, the, the pandemic did, uh, you know, force us to be a little bit more creative than normal. I, I've always felt that rural transit systems are creative anyway in order to survive. Sarah Cook is Swart's longtime general manager. She's proud that her team is one of only six agencies honored for their work during the pandemic by the Federal Transit Administration. Cynthia Rodriguez is part of that management team. Apart from wanting to continue our services, we wanted to make sure that our employees were taken care of as well. Felix Cisnero says he's not surprised by that recognition. It really helps a lot, especially for these little towns like this, you know. Well, you have like San Antonio and stuff like that. You can get on the bus, go anywhere. But here, SWART, I love it. While many of SWART's users don't have vehicles, Sarah Doggo Cook says they are seeing an increase in people who do have vehicles using the service because they want to save money on fuel when they need to head to areas like San Antonio, Kerrville, or Eagle Pass. Now, as for this evening's traffic, watching uh, this on Loop 410 at Cherry Ridge, see if you can make it out. There it is, right there. A little different angles we get when there's night time here. So let's take a look at your travel time approaching uh, the crossroads, 13 minutes westbound from 281, only four minutes the other direction gives you an idea of the delay. Also still watching this crash, loop 1604 westbound at I-35. And then taking the wide view really quickly, you can see some other issues, including loop 1604 and I-10 near downtown. Myra, Stephanie. All right, thanks, Samuel. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 this evening. Oh, Ooh. what a beautiful sight. The lights around the University of the Incarnate Word. We got several festive events to head out to. Yeah, this one in particular has a million lights just in that location alone. But we're going to go over to Zoo Lights, the San Antonio Zoo. That's where our own Adam Kasky joins us live with a look at the events there and with the forecast. Ooh, you're getting ready. <laughs> Tell us. Yes. You know, we were in one of the main areas, you know, where you walk through the walkway, you go past the flamingos, you have all the tall trees above with uh, various birds flying around the trees. This is what we sometimes refer to as the drop zone when you're walking through the zoo with all the birds flying overhead. We made it just in time for the light show. It goes off about every 15 minutes. So that's when the lights go to the music and to different theme songs and you know, different uh, 
Christmas songs and whatnot, and everything goes in order. Then it gets a little techno, a little fun. Anyway, it's, 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 it's exciting. I'm excited. All right, you're going to be able to see it behind us in the background. Of course, like those kids having fun right there. Break dancing at the zoo. Let's take a look at our almanac data. We got a lot of weather to talk about. This morning, we started off at 53, then we topped out at 71, both just a little above average, pretty much on par for the day today. Across the state, we did make it even into 74, a little bit warmer in Del Rio, so a little bit warmer there. But for most of Texas, we were 60s and 70s today, low to mid 70s. Uh, you look at the current reading, 63 here in San Antonio, the temperature's falling off quickly. Next half hour, I think I'm gonna have my jacket on. I'm already starting to feel a little bit of that chill in the air. And the dew points are down. That's one reason why. Dew points 20s and 30s. It's feeling fall-like all across the Lone Star State right now. With that dry air, clear sky, calm wind, radiational cooling, temperatures fall off quickly. Take a look at the forecast this evening. By 10 o'clock, right near 50 degrees. Midnight will be down in the 40s. And then by tomorrow morning, check out these temperatures. This is what we expect the map to look like. Widespread upper 30s to lower 40s. So a chill in the air for early risers tomorrow. Usually we hit our low temperature around 7 a.m. and that's when we're going to be in the lower 40s for most of us. I mean, you look close around San Antonio, Stone Oak 41, Lavernia 41, Lake Hills, Leon Springs 39 along with Timberwood Park tomorrow morning. So get ready for that. However, our mornings, they get warmer. By Thanksgiving morning, it's gonna be humid and rainy, and actually relatively mild with temperatures in the mid 60s. The trick is by Thanksgiving, by the afternoon, the temperatures fall throughout the day. So let's get to the weather pattern and what's gonna make things really change throughout the day on Thanksgiving. Quiet across the state right now, some high clouds rolling overhead, upper level high, big blue H. No, not a big blue H, a medium blue H moving overhead. We, we're looking off to the Pacific. That's our next upper level energy and some Pacific moisture we're gonna tap into. That's heading our way. It's gonna affect us on Thanksgiving and then again the following Saturday. That combined with the cold front, we're gonna squeeze some showers out for the first half of the day on Thanksgiving. So we look at that and our future cast is even showing us how the rain moves in for the first part of Thursday and then it moves out for about the second half of the day. Here's the breakdown of the forecast for tomorrow. We're looking at 43 in the morning, near 70 by the afternoon, a mixture of sun and clouds, mainly just those high clouds and you know, another cool start to the day, but a comfortable afternoon. The seven day forecast is key here tomorrow. The cloud, not tomorrow, but Wednesday, I should say. The clouds really fill in. We'll have the low gray clouds. It's going to be sticky and humid. And then we'll have some fog and drizzle around on Wednesday. Wednesday night, some hit or miss showers coming and going, scattered in nature, then becoming more widespread and numerous for the first half of your Thanksgiving. So you wake up early, start prepping everything in the kitchen, maybe fire up the pit, the smoker out back anticipate rain it's going to be damp and it's also going to be humid we'll be in the mid 60s in the morning on thanksgiving then dropping off to near 60 and maybe even only upper 50s by the afternoon so we're going to cool throughout the day thanksgiving and of course the wind is going to pick up it's going to become pretty gusty on your t thanksgiving by friday yeah good day to put up christmas lights not bad not as windy mostly cloudy right near 60. it'll get you in the spirit of christmas and christmas lights and then by saturday a few more rounds of rain moving through some scattered showers at that point and cool only in the 50s with that rain and dampness on Saturday. So if you can, Friday's good light, a good day to get your Christmas lights and your decorations out. And then again on Sunday after Thanksgiving would be another good day to get those Christmas decorations out. This is fun, but we've got more fun for you coming up next half hour live from Zoo Lights. Again, this is every night until January 2nd. You can come out with the family and enjoy. And by the way, their season passes, Black Friday sale already going on, 30% off. Boom. See you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to know. I bet that's going to be packed this week. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. All right, let's turn to sports now. Spurs back home. Hopefully, the change in venue is what they need because the road has been rough. <laughs> yes, Greg Simmons now joins us live from the AT&T Center. So apparently, things have been so rough, Greg, that the players actually did something. Yeah, they actually had a players-only meeting after that loss in Minnesota. Now, this is information we're usually not privy to, but I think it's the players' effort to show they're just as concerned as the fans are about the direction this season is going. What up? We'll find out tonight. Also, when we come back, what is the fallout to the bloody mini Motown meltdown? Coming up.
everybody, and welcome live to the AT&T Center, where the Spurs return home for the Thanksgiving holidays to start a four-game homestand against the red-hot Phoenix Suns. Now, the Spurs could not be catching the Suns at a worse time. They're on a 12-game win streak. They're the second-best team in the NBA, while the Spurs are on a four-game losing streak, trying to avoid the first five-game losing streak tonight. So after losing every game on their three-game road trip, including the blowout 115-90 loss to the Timberwolves in Minnesota. Today, we learned a shoot-around that following their worst defeat of the season prompted a players-only team meeting in the locker room. What was the message delivered by veteran Thaddeus Young to his younger teammates? The one biggest thing that uh, that I did leave the guys with was, you know, the, there's, there's not going to be a changing point until it starts to hit here. You know, when everybody starts to feel the same way about it hitting their hearts and it starts to weigh heavy on their hearts, you know, then that's when we're going to have some change because, you know, that feeling, that's a hard feeling, feeling that's a hard pill to swallow and that's a, a hard feeling to, to try to take care of. So, you know, you'll do whatever it takes not to feel that feeling again. And I think that's when, you know, we're going to, we're going to see a curve and a change in what we're, what's going on out on the court. All right, we'll see if that starts tonight, 7.30, tip time here at the AT&T Center. Chaos in Detroit as bloodied Isaiah Stewart is having to be restrained multiple times trying to get at Lakers star LeBron James. A mini Motown meltdown again. Here's what happened. Stewart and LeBron were fighting for a rebound at the free throw line when King James' elbow and fist made contact with Stewart in the face. At first, Stewart seems to be okay, but then flies into a rage trying to go after James. He's ejected, so is James. Even Russell Westbrook gets hit with a T for being an escalator. Now, James is suspended for one game. Stewart for two without pay. The UTSA Roadrunners have swept all the Conference USA Weekly Awards today after their dramatic last-second 34-31 victory over UAB to clinch the Conference USA West Division title. Quarterback Frank Harris has been named the Conference USA's Offensive Player of the Week for the second time this season after passing for 323 yards and three touchdowns, including the remarkable game winner that was tipped in the hands of Oscar Cardenas. Outside linebacker Clarence Hicks also collected his second Conference USA Defensive Player of the Week award after two big-time sacks, and kicker Hunter Duplessis picking up his third Conference USA Special Teams Player of the Week for a pair of long field goals on all four extra points. Head coach Jeff Trader tweeted out that he might watch this a few times. So how many times did he view this winning touchdown? I was like a little fanboy just on Twitter, you know, just uh, acting like a little child, just having fun and being a kid. I would say minimum of 20 times, uh, 15 to 20 probably. <laughs> and get this, UTSA Athletics announcing today that all UTSA students will be allowed free tickets to the Conference USA title game on Friday, December the 3rd in the Alamo Dome. Distribution will begin on Monday. It's definitely a hard goodbye. And so, you know, it's really not even goodbye. It's like, I'll see you soon. All right, you heard it first last night. DeMarvin Leal confirming he has played his last game in Aggieland before the junior defensive lineman out of Judson makes himself available for the NFL draft. DeMarvin making the announcement with his mom by his side as they helped out the Salvation Army here in San Antonio at Thanksgiving time. And now the only question is, where will he go in the first round? We'll find out in 2022. Live from the AT&T Center, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. All right, Greg, thank you. Got it. We'll be right back. Now to the latest on that deadly incident at a parade in Wisconsin. One person now in custody after allegedly fleeing another crime and then driving a vehicle into a holiday parade route near Milwaukee. This is just a horrible story. Yeah. Six of the 18 children admitted to a local hospital there listed in critical condition. That's according to officials at Children's Wisconsin. ABC's Faith Abube has more from Waukesha. A joyous holiday scene turned into a tragedy when an SUV drove through the crowd at the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Investigators have the driver of the red SUV in custody. There's no pursuit that led up to this incident. This is not a terrorist event. At least five people died and more than 40 injured when 39-year-old Daryl Brooks plowed his car into the parade and its onlookers. Matthew Rood was watching the annual event with his family. They were not injured. But I just, I didn't know what was happening. I just didn't keep my, take my eyes off of the SUV. But at the same time, I was grabbing my children. And the next thing I knew, my back was against the wall. 
Part of the mayhem was caught on the city's live stream of the parade and various cell phone cameras. One video shows a child dancing in the street as the SUV speeds by just a few feet behind her. Other videos show the frantic efforts to get help for those struck by the vehicle. Uh, we came across the little boy that was in the road. Um, turning purple. The Milwaukee Dancing Grannies posted on its Facebook page that two of its members were among the dead, calling those lost extremely passionate grannies. That was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. That was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. All right, now Daryl Brooks has been charged with five counts of intentional first-degree homicide. He faces additional charges, and authorities are saying that he wasn't being pursued by police when he drove through that crowd. Closing arguments began for the three men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery. The prosecution's closing arguments took the jury through the events of what led up to that fatal shooting. The defense argued the men's actions were justified. That trials lasted more than two weeks now. More than 20 witnesses have been called to testify, and that trial is now in the hands of the jury. The Department of the Interior has formally identified the term squaw as derogatory, and it's working to rename federal lands that currently have offensive names. According to the University of Idaho, the word squaw was initially introduced by Lewis and Clark in 1805, and over time, it came to be used as a slur in reference to indigenous or Native American women. Now, according to the Department of the Interior, there are more than 650 federal land units that contain that very term. Back here at home, Thanksgiving just three days away, a local nonprofit is trying to make sure that families have that special meal. Yeah, the nonprofit Fuerza Unida is hosting a Thanksgiving food drive at its headquarters on the southwest side, distributing dozens of boxes filled with turkey and Thanksgiving sides. All about the sides. Yes. Tiffany Huertas with what that means to families there to receive it. Los precios han subido muchísimo, entonces con esta ayuda nos... Pues nos ayudan. Maria Barona says food prices have gone up. Gracias. And these boxes filled with Thanksgiving food is helping this holiday season. Muy agradecida con la con, con Fuerza Unida. Barona is thankful for the local nonprofit Fuerza Unida, who hosted a Thanksgiving food drive this morning. Fuerza Unida formed to um, advocate on behalf of women workers and workers of color. And so now we just do community advocacy. We do a food pantry each month. Members of the nonprofit and local volunteers distributed boxes filled with turkeys and other items. Canned vegetables, canned um, green beans and canned uh, corn, and cranberry sauce, gravy, mashed potatoes. 200 boxes full of food just in time for Thanksgiving, all donated by the food bank, businesses, and District 4. We have a lot of families that are living paycheck to paycheck. These boxes will help families who may be struggling to put food on the table this holiday. It means a lot to them to just have that that stress taken off their back. And it also means a lot to them to just know that somebody in the organization, in the community is caring about them. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead, a program designed to help students with college applications is not only benefiting them, but the local economy too. You're going to find out how up next. Students across the country and San Antonio are ramping up their college application processes. This can be so daunting for students and their families, but as Max Massey shows us, the San Antonio Education Partnership hosting a special event at Cafe College to help out. I wouldn't be where I am if programs like Cafe College, programs like SAP, Road to Success, if those programs weren't here, I would not have been able to go to college, not only to, but through and graduate. Fatima Montez is from San Antonio, and she is now a proud graduate of Notre Dame, working to help local students and local families through the process she knows firsthand. I'm a first-generation college student, so my parents did not go through this process. So as I was going through it myself, there was a lot of confusion. San Antonio has a lot of first education first generation college students and so those students need that support because they don't always have people in their immediate circle who have experience with this, who know how to guide them through this process. The College Enrollment Feast is designed to help students apply for financial aid and walk them through this process of applying to college. So they're going to expect um, workshops. They also are going to get assistance with um, applications, admissions, essays. 
um, searching for scholarships, things like that. Helping local students get to colleges like these is so important for local families, but it also means a lot for our local economy. We're building that pipeline of talent locally so that we're getting these students into college to get those degrees and then they're going to come back here and work in this space and, and be able to grow our local economy. The program goes on from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. today and tomorrow with local college representatives there to help answer any questions. As for Fatima, she wants all students here to know your opportunities are limitless. It's possible, right? I feel like there's so many things that are telling you you can't do this. This isn't for you. But students need to realize that this is a potential for them. This is possible for them. And even if they feel that they can't do it right now, it's never too late and they are never having to do it alone. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Thanks very much, Max. Taking a look at some construction uh, related events tonight. Uh, not there won't be as much this week, probably after Wednesday because of the holiday, but we do have some things here and there, including State Highway 151 at Loop 410, some alternating lane closures right there at the interchange for some road work. Uh, we told you last week that the Loop 1604 project to segment three or this segment between I-10 and 281 is kicking off and we're going to have some road work there along that stretch as they set barriers and get ready for the major work on the project. So watch out for some lane closures in that area. Now we take you up here uh, to I-35 southbound in New Braunfels area, FM 306 to the river. There'll be some lane closures and paving work tonight beginning at 9. Uh, taking a look at the area, we still have a few issues here and there, including on the uh, northeast side, there is a crash there at 1604. And this is slow traffic here, 1604 and tradesmen approaching the I-10-1604 interchange. Stephanie, Myra? Thanks, Sam. All right, if you're not hitting the road this holiday week, you're staying here at home. Plenty of things to get out and do with friends and family, but you're going to want to watch the forecast. Oh, definitely. But we have one suggestion for you where you could take your family <laughs> from now, I think, for the next six weeks or so. Adam Kasky joining us live now from the San Antonio Zoo. And we've moved over to the Flamingo Light area. So these oaks are all wrapped nicely in their pink lights, and there's a little flyway there where that's uh, sparkling and glittering and kind of moving in its own little pattern. And you can maybe hear the, the music in the background. That's that light show that goes off about every 15 minutes. It goes from Christmas songs to like club Christmas and little techno with it. It's great. Now we do have a lot of weather to talk about coming up here in a few minutes because we've got big changes, a cold front, an upper level system. During the day on Thanksgiving, things are going to be changing throughout the day and it does entail some rain as well and temperatures are going to be all over the place so we're going to get to those details and show you the brand spanking new light tunnel coming right up So this is really an awesome time of year when there's so much that you could do around San Antonio to get you right in the holiday spirit I think it's going to be a big week for that, the holiday week, but you, you really got to pay attention to what's yes. going on with the weather. So many of these events outside. Let's go outside to Zoo Lights with Adam Kasky. Ooh, look at that. The tunnel. Yes, the light tunnel changes patterns, different colors, different patterns. Ooh, kind of makes it a little, a little swirly look down there. This is fun to walk through. You see a lot of the families getting their pictures taken here and the kids just in awe being able to walk through. And this is actually one of the the new displays here at Zoo Lights, which by the way, runs through January 2nd, so plenty of opportunities to get out here and kids are off school this week. The weather's going to be changing a lot. Now I've switched over to the light jacket as temperatures are starting to fall off, but there'll be times this week where you don't need it necessarily at night. Other times you definitely need it. So let's get right to it. Right now, outside we're at 63 degrees, dew point in the 30s. That's a huge drop in dew point, which means we have this dry, crisp air that's in place. You take a look at area-wide temperatures, and we already have some lower 50s in the hill country. I mean, even near 50 degrees in Fredericksburg, it's still some 60s elsewhere, and even 67 currently in Catula Pleasanton at 57. The dew points, that's what it's all about. 20s, 30s, dry air, mostly clear sky, calm wind, so temperatures falling off quickly as they often do this time of year. But we're gonna see a little yo-yo action in those temperatures, so let's get right to it, full screen. This is what we're talking about with our weather pattern this evening. First of all, we're gonna fall quickly through the 50s, and by 10 o'clock, we'll be right near 50 degrees, probably several locations in the upper 40s. 
And overall, another chilly night. I mean, look at what we're expecting tomorrow morning. 37 in Kerrville, 41 in Uvalde, 41 in Gonzales and Canyon Lake. In and around San Antonio, mostly lower 40s. But you take a look at outline areas, especially Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, Lake Hills, Bernie, upper 30s tomorrow morning. It's going to be short-lived. Temperatures will warm up pretty quickly throughout the day. But I want to focus on those morning temperatures. You know, another cool start to the day or chilly start to the day tomorrow. But then we quickly warm up Wednesday morning. We're well into the 50s, even near 60. Thanksgiving morning for turkey trots, those fun runs, everything that's going on. We'll be in the mid 60s and humid. So you'll notice the humidity in mid 60s only to then fall off again by the end of the week and through the upcoming weekend. So here's the explanation for it all. Here's our weather pattern. Quiet right now. A uh, little upper level high pressure system. A blue H is settling overhead. So you know, another quiet day today, another quiet day tomorrow. It's been some nice, agreeable, comfortable weather in the afternoons here. Upper level disturbance over the Pacific. That swirl out there just west of the Baja Peninsula. That's headed our way, and it's going to take its sweet old time moving through. So that means a few opportunities of rain. Combine that with the cold front and Thanksgiving, the first part of the day. I mean, we're talking Wednesday night, drizzle, sprinkles, a few showers. Thursday morning, Thanksgiving morning, some passing rain with some drizzle mixed in between as well. And then by Thursday afternoon, we'll see the showers move out and just have some clouds lingering around. But that 60% chance on Thursday, that's mainly for the first half of the day, including early morning activities, fun runs, turkey trots, whatever you want to call them. Saturday, looks like another round of showers. We give that 40% coverage across our area. So here's the breakdown for tomorrow. Low 40s in the morning. We pointed out earlier some places in the upper 30s. A lot of high thin clouds streaming overhead, making it to 70 degrees. So jacket maybe in the morning, but by the afternoon, shorts, short sleeves, that's okay, at least the short sleeves, and a lack of humidity in the air. We're gonna spend some time on this seven day forecast because you really gotta take this in. Things change a lot throughout the week. Low 70s again on Wednesday, but it's gonna be damp. You'll notice the humidity, some morning fog and drizzle, so just some dampness out there on Wednesday, Thursday morning passing showers, some areas of rain, which is good. Keep in mind, we could use the rain. I know the timing isn't perfect, but it's good and beneficial for us. We could use it. And it's going to get windy on Thursday. So the rain's done by the afternoon, but that's when the wind picks up and the temperature drops throughout the day. So Thursday afternoon is actually going to be cooler than the morning. We'll be near 60 and maybe even in the upper 50s. Friday, mostly cloudy, near 60, a fine day to get outside. Not much of a breeze either to get outside and put up the Christmas decorations. Saturday, Back to some showers and cool at about 57 degrees for the high temperature on Saturday. So Saturday damp and cool. And then we round out the weekend with more agreeable weather. So I know a lot of ups and downs, a lot to take in with the seven day forecast. Just have your KSAT 12 Weather Authority app ready to go. We send out the notifications and you get automatic notifications when you enable them, when there's rain nearby or even lightning nearby. Because Thursday morning we could have a few cracks of thunder mixed in. Been a fun time here at the San Antonio Zoo. And do keep in mind, if you want to get that season pass, they are, what, 30% off right now? 30% off uh, right now through the for their Black Friday sale. So that's something to keep in mind. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. You liking the lights? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about Merry Christmas on three? One, two, three. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. I know it's a little early to say that for some of you, but we're in the spirit, okay? Never too early. No, we'll take it. Not at all. Cassie live from Polar Point. <laughs> there at the zoo lines. <laughs> all right, thank you. And in case you missed it, it's coming up next. Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, November 22nd. This morning, a bonfire in a backyard leads to a house fire on our city's east side. When they arrived, they could see heavy flames showing through the roof. They were worried about it spreading to the house next door, but fire crews were able to knock it out. Everyone at the home got out safely, but there was substantial damage done to the house. Now, first at five, San Antonio police have arrested the man they think carried out a shooting last night. The suspect's name is Daniel Perez. He's 28. Investigators say that he shot a man at an apartment complex on Broadway right across from the Pearl. According to a sergeant at the scene, a group was inside one of those units when an argument started, and then those shots were fired. Fired. The 44-year-old victim taken to the hospital, but Perez had already fled the scene. At last check, the victim was in critical condition. It's almost a new year, but before 2022 rolls around, some local nonprofits need help now 
especially in the season of giving. Meals on Wheels has seen uh, requests for meal services just absolutely skyrocket during the entire pandemic. At Meals on Wheels San Antonio, the number of people they serve has doubled. Most of these folks are what we technically call homebound. They have great difficulty leaving their home. They can't get out. The Sunday after Thanksgiving is expected to be the single busiest travel day of the year, with an estimated 2.4 million passengers. The TSA already reporting a record number of travelers on Friday, more than 2.2 million people, with about 70% of Americans planning to spend the holidays with family and friends from outside their own home. Still watching some slowdowns on the uh, west side. This is near Loop 1604 and 151. Uh, traffic down in the red there to 16 miles per hour on 151, so watch out for that. Also still looking at a crash close to this 1604 at Tradesman, Sarah Spivey. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, nice day tomorrow. We'll be up to 70 degrees after a chilly start. Increasing humidity and rain for the first day, first part rather, of Thanksgiving itself. Then that front moves through and we become chilly into the weekend. Saturday looks to be a damp and chilly day as well. Stephanie Amira. And that is Sarah Spivey. I know. Bracing <laughs> us for their presence. She's been here the whole time. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you on the night beat. <laughs>